Well, good morning, everybody. We doing okay? <clears throat> good. It's good to see you. Uh, my name's Chad. For those of you all that, that don't know me, and excited to be with you here this morning. Um, really excited about this new message series that's going to be coming up February 22nd. And we're going to be journeying through the Gospel of Mark, um, looking at the different ways that Jesus brings life out of death. Right? I mean, all, there's so many different encounters that Jesus has all throughout the Gospels of Mark where he's pointing to what he actually does on the cross. All these different ways that he's bringing death, bringing, out, bringing life out of death. He's pointing to what's exactly going to happen when he finally defeats death once and for all as he gives his life as a sacrifice on the cross that we might have his life because he died our death. And so we see these encounters all throughout the Gospel of Mark where he takes something that looks dead and all of a sudden he brings it to life. My hunch is there are many of you that are like me where there are places in my life that feel dead. And oh, how good it would be if life could come out of that. There are relationships in my life that aren't, really, aren't near as alive as I'd like them to be. And if only God cared enough he could touch those to bring life. I mean, doesn't that sound great? It just does for me. So we're going to spend several weeks just looking at that, diving into it. If you've been with us um, the last few weeks, we've been journeying through this message series called Heartbeat. And we've been looking at what is the heartbeat of us here in this family? Meaning, what are our values and our vision? What are the values that are going to shape who we are, shape our relationships when it comes to our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, and our relationship with the world. And then when those things come together, what kind of action do they produce? That action, that doing, is our vision. And so our values, as you've been with us, you know, are risk, excellence, passion, authenticity. And when those things come together, it produces a specific action. It, it produces a group of people that live at the crossroads between the brokenness of the world and the transforming love of Jesus Christ. Because when brokenness crosses paths with the love of Jesus, a transformation takes place every single time. Now, I do think it's important for us to remember that this is not just something that we're pulling out of the air. Everything needs to come back to Jesus' life. And if we look at Jesus' life, we need to ask the question, what are his values? What are the things that shape his relationship with his father and with those around him? What's the action that it produces? So, anybody got a guess? What do you think Jesus' values are? Am I going to be brave enough to put it out there? <laughs> Well, I wish, I, I wish that it was exactly that. I, I think if we look at Jesus' life, when it comes to his values, right, that's about covenant. And so there's a piece of scripture, someone asks him, what's the greatest commandment? In other words, they, they say to him, what's the thing that defines your relationship? And he says this, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and to do what? Love your neighbor as yourself. In the Gospel of Luke, right after that comes the story of the Good Samaritan, which there's no such thing as a Good Samaritan. It's as if Jesus is saying, Your neighbor is not just the person you like, but it's also the person that's against you. You're to love God and love people. Pretty simple, right? And when those things come together, what action does it produce? Well, we see that Jesus, when those things come together, he builds a family. That's what he does. He invites 12 people into his life, and they, together, are a family that's on mission. And he says to them, right before he leaves, after he's resurrected from the dead, he leaves them with this call to action, which is his vision, to go and make disciples, 
baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, Spirit. In other words, immerse them into our family name. I've been building a family. Our family name is Father, Son, Spirit. Immerse them into our family name and teach them to do everything that I've taught you to do. All right? So we should see the same thing from those folks. So if we go to the book of Acts and we go to chapter 2, if you've got your Bibles with you, go ahead and turn there with me. Um, Acts is right after the Gospels, the story of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Then we go to Acts. The same guy that writes Luke, who is Luke, also writes Acts. And we're going to go to Acts chapter 2. We're going to read verses 42 through 47. Now, before we read um, these five short verses, it's amazing to me um, that as Luke describes this family, that he describes them with complete certainty. We're not talking about four or five people here. 3,000 folks have just become followers of Jesus. And there's some argument, is that just 3,000 men? Does it mean like women and children? Is that everybody? But the bare minimum, we've got 3,000. That's a significant number. You know, it seems it's significant. And as Luke describes that family, it's not just Peter's household. It's not just Andrew's. No, it's all the believers. As he describes them, he does with complete certainty, this is what they devoted themselves to. 3,000 are committed to these things, all right? Now, as we read it, we should see Jesus' heartbeat. We should see a sense of loving God and loving people. We should see a sense of wanting to build out a family, all right? Let's read this together. All the believers, all, not part of them, 10% of the 3,000, all of them, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. All the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Wow. Pretty impressive family, right? Pretty impressive family. So one of the ways that we articulate, we ask ourselves the question of what were their values? What shaped them? How would we describe their love of God, their love for each other, and their love for those who were outside of God's family? When we look at their love for God, we would describe it, some language that we've used has been helpful, is they were passionate. About their spirituality. Right? They were passionate about their spirituality. They went to the temple every day. They were devoted to the teaching. And they didn't just outsource worship to the worship team. No, it was them. They were devoted to loving God, to growing in what it means to be a part of God's family. If we look at how they interact with each other, they're so generous, aren't they? They're so devoted to one another. They're so committed to each other. They share what they have with one another. There's someone that has need. They just take care of it. Some language that we've said that's been helpful with that is they are radical in their community life.
And radical, not in something new or flashy, but radical meaning they're committed to what Jesus was committed to. They're committed to what Jesus was committed to. They're committed to radical community, to being one with one another. And then the craziest thing happens. People actually like them. They actually like them. People like Christians. Who would have thought that? I mean, we don't see a lot of that in our world today for those who are outside of the church. They liked them. They experienced the goodwill of the people. And what did God do every single day? He added to their number those who were being saved. There's this sense that they didn't look at people like as notches on their spiritual belt. They didn't feel like they had to convince or sell someone Jesus. They just said, we're living this way. This is the best way to live. We're the most fun people on the face of the planet because we have more to celebrate than anybody else on the face of the planet. And everybody said, well, I'd like some of that too. And so they were a part of it. And God adds to their number those who are being saved every single day. Some words we've used to describe that is that They practice missional zeal. So as we look at them, we see them loving God, loving one another, and loving those outside of their community. Right? We see a piece of their heartbeat. We see their value. So for us, what we've said, there should be a connection. So how would we articulate this kind of life as a family? How would we articulate our passion for God? How would we articulate the way in which we're radically committed to one another? Not as something that's new or different, but something that points to Jesus. How would we be zealous and fervent in our mission for people to enjoy us that they might actually become a part of this family? What would we say we would describe that if we were practicing those kinds of values? We said, well, it'd be risk. And excellence, and passion, and authenticity. That's what we'd go after that would help that. When it comes to our posture towards God, our posture with each other, our posture with those that are around the world, that are outside of us, um, that that are living out of relationship with God. Now, as we said, when these things come together, when they converge, what kind of action do they produce? All right. And here's where we want to talk today. When these values come together, what do they produce? They produce the vision that we're going for. They produce a red hot center. They produce a bonfire. A bonfire of God's kingdom. That when people pass through it, they experience a slice of heaven. Because anytime someone passed through Jesus and his disciples' life, what did they always experience? They always experienced what true, authentic life actually was. Whenever someone passed through the life of this first family in the books of Acts that we just read, they always experienced a picture, a glimpse of what life truly was. The question is, when people pass through our lives... When they pass through our family here, do they experience a glimpse of what true, authentic life is? And so what we've said is that this crossroads between people's brokenness of their life and the love that we know at Jesus, whenever they pass through there, a transformation takes place within their life. The reason why this is important for us is twofold. One is is this defines the battle that we're in. It defines the battle that we're in. It reminds us who the real enemy is. Like, you're not the real enemy. I'm not the enemy. People who don't know Jesus is not the enemy. The enemy is the places within our world that don't look like God's kingdom. 
The enemy is the one who wants to steal, kill, and destroy that seeks to manipulate us into living a life that doesn't look like this life. The enemy is things within our life and culture that wants to keep us away from passing through this red-hot center, from becoming the bonfire that God desires for us to be. And so as I look at our culture, I see that manifested in a number of different ways, but some of those that jump out to me is this, consumerism. It's all about what I can consume. The more that I consume the happier I'm going to be. That's a lie. That's a lie. Um, I heard this week, I wish I had the exact data for you so you could all Google it right now and go see it. Um, But since the 1950s, we've watched consumerism skyrocket. But people, when it comes to their joy and happiness, has at the same time going downhill. As consumerism is going up, joy and happiness is going down. That people were happier in the 1950s than than we are right now. Isn't that interesting? Another way that I see it manifest itself is individualism. That I don't need anybody else but me. And I need to protect everything I have for me. I need to compete against you to better off me. In other words, the lie of it's me before we, not we before me. That I come first. And the result of all of that is living an isolated life. That's the enemy. That's the enemy. That's what we're fighting against. That is what Jesus defeated on the cross. He's the hero who beat the villain. And now he's invited us into this epic battle of good versus evil. And our job, as we fight the fight that's in front of us, is to live with the same heartbeat that he had. And so what we've described here in this family is that our heartbeat, our values, are Risk, excellent, passion, authenticity, when they come together and converge, it produces this red-hot center where we live at the crossroads between the brokenness of the world and the transforming love of Jesus Christ. That when people pass through that, they say, huh, maybe it's actually better to participate than consume. Maybe it's actually better to be in community than to be an individual. Maybe it's actually better to open up my life than to live an isolated life. Now, the second thing is anytime someone passes through this red hot center, anytime somebody passes through a crossroads where brokenness touches the love of Jesus, that our spiritual capital increases. Our spiritual gravitas, our spiritual um, capacity increases any time we pass through that red hot center. See, the difference between spiritual capital and the other capitals, and you've heard me say it before, but I'll say it again, you've got financial capital, you've got physical capital, you've got intellectual capital, you've got relational capital, and you've got spiritual capital. The difference between spiritual capital and all the other ones is that you can pass through it and gain more of it. See, I can't pass through your physical capital and my bicep get bigger. Right? I can't pass through your life with your guns and all of a sudden I've got the same gun that you have. It doesn't work that way. I can't pass through your checkbook and my bank account look like your bank account. It doesn't work that way, right? But with spiritual capital, it's different. If I pass through your life, I actually get more of Jesus. I can pass through the torch of your life, the red hot center of your life, and my spiritual capital increases. Sometimes we'll talk about the way in which we orbit one another's life. That as we orbit one another's life, as we pass through one another's lives, our spiritual capital increases the more in which we do that. So for us, 
We want to be a crossroads between people and Jesus. We want to create space for people to pass through our lives. And as they pass through our lives, we're trusting this, that we'll enjoy the goodwill, that they'll actually get something from it. We'll enjoy the goodwill of all the people. And then as they pass through our lives, the Lord will add to our number, not just us as in crossroads, but his kingdom will add to our number those who are being saved, meaning those who say there's a better life than consumerism, individualism, being isolated. There's a better way. No longer do I think that death is the final say, but now life will have the final say within my life. Our hope is this. Our hope is that Sunday morning is not the only bonfire, right? Here's what we hope. We hope that as we all pass through this, right, as we pass through this bonfire within our lives, and the more we pass through it, our torches get a little brighter, Right? The more that I pass through your life, the more that I'm doing life with you, the more that I'm loving God, loving you, and loving others, my torch gets a little brighter. And the brighter my torch gets, all of a sudden, I can support other torches. So now, all of a sudden, I start to become a red-hot center. And people start passing through my life. All of a sudden, their torches get a little bit brighter. See, our hope is Sunday morning just isn't the only bonfire around here. Our hope is that your life, your homes, where you live, that you're a red-hot center, that you articulate what your gospel heartbeat is for your family, how you're going to love God and love people, and that as you're growing in your spiritual capacity, you're able to support more people passing through your life That as they pass through your life, they encounter Jesus. That their torches get a little bit brighter. And sooner or later, they're going to be a bonfire where they can can support other torches. You see how this works? On and on and on and on. But it all comes down to first, I think, two basic questions. Do we view this life as a have-to life or a get-to life? Is being a follower of Jesus a have-to life? I have to do this. I have to go to church. I have to be in missional community. I have to serve. I have to give. I have, have. have. Is it a have-to life or is it a get-to life? I get to come to worship. I get to be vested in the family. I get to have responsibility. See, a have-to life, a have-to follower of Jesus, it's all about obligation and it's all about duty. It's all about checking the box. And I think the reason that we view it this way is often we keep one foot in the kingdom of the world and we try to keep one foot in the kingdom of God. We keep one foot in the kingdom of the world. We keep one foot in the kingdom of God. We try to ride the fence. We try to live a double life. And the reality is a double life is not possible. It will simply wear you out. It will leave you exhausted. It will leave you empty. Because none of us have the physical capital of time to live two lives. I don't know about you, but I don't get 48 hours a day. I only get 24. So there's no way that we can live a double life. Now, what happens is is when these two worlds collide, we often do this. We often move to looking at Jesus as we have to. We've got all this time in the world. We've just got that foot in there. And we think, you know what? I know that being a follower of Jesus is important, so I have to at least get to church every now and then. I I, I have to at least check this box because I want to get all the benefit of what it means to be a part of that family. 
but I just don't know if I can say no over here. And we just end up exhausted, just completely empty. So if, if that's where you are this morning, right, if it's a have to and not a get to, just very simply with, you know, we talked last week about the different kind of gifts and the pastor nurturing gift. This is, this is nurturing what I'm getting ready to say, all right? With, with as, much as, I lo- as much as I care and love for you, if it's a have to life, you've missed it. You've missed it. You've missed it completely. You're believing something other than the message of Jesus. You think you've got a Rolex watch on and you don't. It's not real. It's not a have to. It's a get to life. Now, when it comes to a get-to life, a get-to follower of Jesus, they're compelled by genuine love that produces action. It's we have a hero who won the battle, who won the battle for us, and now they've invited us to join them into the victory mission. We're compelled to take action. We're compelled by genuine love. It's a different mindset. We get to live by these values. We get to orbit through the red hot center. We get to participate within the family. We get to. The difference between a follower of Jesus and a cultural Christian is just that same difference of a fake Rolex and the real thing. They might look kind of similar on the outside, but they are completely different different. So, a valid question, I think, is this. Well, why do you have expectations then at Crossroads? I mean, why, why do you have a covenant for folks who want to become teammates here? Why do you have expectation and responsibilities? Because that, that seems like duty. That seems like obligation. Like, why is that the case? Why, why do you have that? I think it's a valid question. Here's why we have it. We know how real the battle is. We know how real the temptation is. And that without a hedge of protection within my life, I promise you, without you in my life, without being devoted to God, devoted to you, and devoted to those who don't love Jesus, I will always resort to me before we, consumerism, individual isolated life. I promise you I will. Like, I'm not here today because I've got it all together. I'm here because if I don't immerse myself in this life, I'm going to be the first one that'll go away. The reason that we say yes to things like missional community and Sunday morning, the reason we say yes in our family to orbiting through the red hot center is because if we don't, we will fall away. I promise you I will. I need a hedge of protection. I need a framework of discipline that helps me to live this get-to life so I get to experience everything that God has for me. Yesterday, uh, Lexi came up to me. She's my six-year-old. Came up to me and said, let's go for a run. I thought, really? Really? That's awesome. She's like, yeah, let's go for a run. And so we went for a run. And it was all good until we got out there running. She loved the idea of running. And it wasn't long till she kind of, she fell back a little bit. Now she started off, she was sprinting in front of me, like, I'll beat you to the white mailbox. And she'd run to the white mailbox and look back and laugh. I'm like, honey, you better just kind of run with me. We're going to go a little ways. Nah. And she just, you know, but sooner or later, what happened? She got tired, and she started falling back. Now, she didn't say, Dad, let's go for a walk. She said, Dad, let's go for a run. So I'm running. I'm not going to change the expectation. I'm running. I said, come on, honey. You're falling back. Let's go. Let's go. Finally, she said this. She said, will you hold my hand? I thought, oh, that's brilliant. And so she reached out and held my hand so that we would run together. And if she had a hold of me, she knew she wouldn't fall back. 
See, so often we start this life, we start orbiting through the red hot center, and we start sprinting. We think, we've got this. And we get way out ahead. And all of a sudden, we realize it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. All of a sudden, we realize that becoming a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that life gets completely great all the time. It doesn't protect us from things happening. It doesn't protect it from hitting the fan. And sooner or later, we start walking, and we start falling back. And the idea of being a follower and being one are two different things. Well, what we're saying here at Crossroads is this covenant that we have is us reaching our hands out to one another. It's saying, let's grab hold. Because if we grab hold, we won't fall back. We'll be together. We'll run together. The covenant is not saying, when you walk, we walk. No, no, no. We're running. The covenant is saying, let's run together. Let's run together. So that we can become a red hot center as people orbit our lives, that their torches get a little brighter, that they experience the life that God's called us to, that they get to have this life in a way that their torches become bonfires, that they can also support other torches where that can become red hot centers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we continue to push back against the enemy that's seeking to kill, steal, and destroy us within our lives. Another little example is this. So I'm going to do not just a sports analogy, but another analogy, just so you, it's fair, right? Because mostly it's all sports for me. But you can go to a game, right? Like I've been to, to Duke, to the Cameron Crazies, like been there a number of times. Fantastic. We looked pretty good yesterday. I mean, okay, I guess. Um, and I've been to those games, and they are, they're phenomenal, right? They're phenomenal, but you know what? I never get to go to the locker room at halftime. I never get to go. And as much as I like being there, I don't really get the full participation of someone that's on the team, do I? Like, I don't ever get Coach K chewing me out. Now, that may not sound like fun to some of you, but I think that'd be a blast. <laughs> I just don't get that. As much as I watch the game, I don't get the practice where it's like, what in the world am I doing? I don't get that. In the same way, if you've ever been in a play or a musical or a dance recital, and you go and watch it, and it's great, it's lovely, it's all those things, but you never get to go backstage, do you? You never get to experience backstage. You never get to experience the rehearsals. It's different. It's different. It's the same way. It's the same way in God's family. There's a difference between watching and participating. And what we're saying is God's called us in our heartbeat to be participants in this battle, participants in this journey. So we get to be in covenant with each other. We get to have expectations. We get to have accountability. We get to make our city and our region look more like heaven. We get to invest our time and our talent and our treasure to make this a reality. There's a huge difference between a have-to Christian and a get-to Christian. And our answer, I think, is connected to how willing we are to orbit through the red hot center, the vision that God has called us to. It's connected to that, how willing we are to orbit through the red hot center in our lives. All right, that's all I got this morning. Um, as we're getting ready to close, just a couple things let's just be thinking about, all right? What's the one thing that's grabbing your attention this morning? Out of all of this, what's the one thing that's grabbing your attention? And specifically, where do you feel conviction or incompetence? Where do you feel like you're missing the mark?
And what I'm learning, those places where I feel like I'm missing the mark, that's the place that God's really pressing in. And that pressing in is not a pressing in to push you away. It's it's not a pressing in to say, you're bad. You messed up. You're not doing your job. You're dead weight. It's not saying that at all. That conviction is saying this. I'd like to have more of you. I'd like for the world to have less of you. And I'd like to have more. I'd like you to trust me that my way's the best way and the world's way isn't. That's all that is. It's just an invitation to come close. It's an invitation to pass through the bonfire that your torch would be a little brighter when you left here today. That's all that is. That's all that is. The enemy would want you to feel judgment and condemnation. Don't you feel guilty? Don't feel guilty. Feel thankful that you've got to experience that conviction today. And that God's calling you close. I mean, praise God, He's speaking, right? Just take a moment, just think quietly. What would it look like for you to take a step towards that today? And for all of you that, that want to take that step, I just want to bless you here this morning, all right? For all of you who want to take a, a step closer to Jesus in your life today, I want, to, I want to bless you this morning. And so if you want to hold your hands out, if you want to keep them closed, if you want to stand up, sit down, doesn't matter to me. I just want to bless you today, all right, in that. Lord, I thank you for these, your servants that are here today, God, that want to come closer to you, that want to move through, pass through the red hot center of your transforming love, that their torches would be brighter as they leave here today than they are right now. God, I thank you that these, your people, are not allowing the enemy to manipulate your conviction for judgment and guilt and condemnation where they would pull back from you. But these, your people here who have responded to you, Lord, are coming close. So God, may you meet them where they are. And may you bless them, Lord, in their lives. May their torches be brighter today, Father. In your name we pray, amen.